Okay, looks like it just hit 11 o'clock, and I know Jim's got a lot of information he wants to present, so we'll get to start right on time. Um, welcome to today's webinar on what changing admissions regulations mean for data center planning and construction. I'm Tim Hanson, our marketing coordinator at Miratech, and I'm joined by our presenter, Jim McDonald, Miratech's Director of Environmental Impact. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them at any time in the questions section. And we'll, find enough, we'll try to find enough time at the end of this webinar to answer at least a few of them. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, please know that we plan on following up and answering any questions that we have and that get submitted during this time. Also, a recorded version of the webinar will be made available, and I'll email that out to everyone that's registered for this event, along with contact information for Jim and I if you have any other follow-up questions. Okay, at this point, let's get started. Jim, take it away. You got me? Yeah. Over there? All yeah. right. Uh, as Tim mentioned, we got a lot of content here. Uh, 50 minutes, I'm gonna to try to be respectful of everybody's time. I usually like these things to be fairly interactive where we can get questions um, and, and work through them as we go. Um, but because there's gonna be somewhere between 100 and 200 people online to get through it and then questions at the end is probably the best way to go. I'm going to turn my webcam off and then uh, get started. Um, you should see uh, a presentation now that, that says regulatory landscape. Tim, we got it. Yeah, we can Are see we it. Good? Yeah. All right. Great. Fantastic. Um, real quick. Uh, Miratech is 30 years old. Uh, this past year, we celebrated our 30th anniversary. We are in excess now of 250 people and, and hiring daily. Um, we're in 15 countries, in excess of $200 million in revenue. Big company, been around for a while. Uh, all we do is stationary engines, um, whether it be natural gas or diesel, uh, but environmental controls on stationary engines. So. Some ground rules as we start. Thank you in advance. I, I when I, when Tim sent me the attendee list for the number of people that were going to be joining, uh, I was thrilled. And there was a lot of familiar names on there. Um, for those on the East Coast, thanks for ordering in lunch. Sorry about doing that to you, um, but I, I appreciate everyone listening in. Uh, and I I have down in here one guy two cents. And what I mean by that is, this is we're we're very very fortunate to be exposed due to projects that we get every year, uh, hundreds of permits. Um, we get to see what's written into the permits in different jurisdictions. Uh, we get to work with the environmental consultants to push back if we need to. Uh, and we're always redesigning our products to, to ensure ongoing compliance for our end users. Um, but all I can share is our interpretation of the regs uh, and what we're seeing out in the field. And, and because we have such a great working relationship with the consultants out there, we love that dialogue and we very much value that dialogue. So I, I wanna keep that going. There's nothing better than sitting down with a consultant over a two hour lunch and just sharing war stories. So if there's anything in here that you disagree with, um, hopefully there's nothing that's blatantly false. Um, then I wouldn't be doing my job. But there's there's a good chance that something will be outdated. Uh, because all of us are in this together trying to interpret the regulations, um, please share with me after the fact uh, through email uh, something that you thought I skewed in the wrong direction or it, I'm working on some old information. Or again, if I'm blatantly false, let me know that too. Um, I'm also going to be trying my best to not use acronyms uh, without defining them. About 15 years ago, I started an Excel spreadsheet of all the acronyms associated with the environmental game. I'm well over 330 acronyms right now with that and the diesel world. The only thing I would suggest when you send me an email is use the EPA guidance on commenting, which is explain your views as clearly as possible, avoiding the use of profanity and personal threats. I always found that amusing. Anyway, the first distinction, probably the most important one that a lot of folks get wrong, even uh, regulators, when we talk about emissions and we talk about pollution, their pollution is a subset of emissions and they're not exactly the same. So when you turn on an engine, a diesel engine, and the rain cap goes up to 45 degrees, everything coming out of that exhaust pipe is an emission. 
but not all of it is pollution. So on the left side here, let's just take a look. The way a diesel engine works is it combusts fuel. So you've got fuel from a fuel tank, you've got an air intake, you're, you're, the, the engine is, is breathing, it's inhaling and exhaling. So it's pulling in air from, from the outside and it's combusting it and it's, it's producing work and heat. Um, but essentially you're, the air that you're pulling in is, is what's on your left here. So, let's mute my phone. So what, what's on the left here is your air composition. Everybody knows this. It's you know, essentially 78% ox, uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen. But the carbon dioxide, this is striking. So a lot of folks don't understand that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now is about 400 parts per million or 0.04%. Um, you see organizations like 350.org that, that the event of the idea is that they're trying to pull the ambient CO2 down further, but right now it's only about 0.04%. Then you bring that into the engine you, and what comes out the other end as emissions, and all of this is emissions, is the nitrogen passes through about 60%, 67% of what comes out of the exhaust pipe is just nitrogen, pass through nitrogen. The CO2 obviously goes up because that's a product of combustion along with the water vapor. And this is for a diesel. On a diesel, the oxygen content is about 9%, but the pollution, the part the, the compounds that would affect your health today are uh, uh, CO, hydrocarbons, NOx, SO2, particular matter. That's actually less than 1% of the total exhaust emissions that are coming out. So when I say pollution, I'm referring to these pollutants, um, and I would classify CO2 as an emission or a greenhouse gas. So the equipment that we make is pollution focused, um, and we can talk a little bit about greenhouse gases in a little bit. The regulations, the best way to look at regulations is always from a top-down perspective. So you start at the federal EPA, uh, they're going to blanket rules across the country, and then you're going to have state regulations, uh, and then you probably will get down into counties and, and local municipalities. I'm sitting in New York City right now. There's a New York City DEP, there is a New York State DEC, and then there's the federal government, and those regs don't match. That's part of our job is trying to figure out how do you end up in compliance with three entities, not to mention potentially OSHA um, with a, a, a pollution source. So that's we're always trying to massage all of that. But as we break this down in this presentation, we're going to start at the federal level, go to the states, and then the local. In my 30 years of doing this, I have never seen a more active regulatory environment than what's out there today. Um, it was fast and furious during the Obama administration, and we're certainly not going to get into politics because <laughs> that is a rabbit hole. But um, it slowed down a little bit, uh, and then it's picked back up again, and it, it has very much become a full-time job. I know the consultants are very busy trying to track all these regulations from a federal and state perspective. Um, this is just kind of a graph of everything with the timeline. It's just taken off immensely. I'm going to start with the, the map on the right. So it's, I, I'm sorry that this is kind of small and difficult to see. But when the Clean Air Act came out in the early 70s in the Nixon administration, the first thing that they did was they came up with national ambient air quality standards. And what those are are a pass-fail criteria for pollution. So you had six criteria pollutants. This map here shows ozone. And you created, you take into account public health, uh, you take into account commerce, you take into account agriculture, a whole bunch of things, what can be affected by pollution. Um, and then you create a pass fail criteria. That is the national ambient air quality standards. It's not a, a number that you're looking for at an exhaust pipe. It's a number that would be measured uh, in the ambient conditions. There's literally literally sniffers on poles measuring ozone across the country on a county by county basis. And then your county gets graded as to whether it's pass or fail. Uh, failing would be non-attainment uh, and passing would be attainment. That's the words that they use. That threshold, pass fail threshold gets reviewed every five years and it, it can, depending on the administration in charge, it can get lowered. It got lowered during the Obama administration it held steady during Trump. Uh, it could potentially get lowered again relatively soon. It's all speculation. But these are the counties there that are in, in blue. Those dark blue are the ones that are currently failing the ozone standard as it sits today, which is 70 ppb. 
Um, the lighter blue is ones that are just barely passing. And then the very light blue are, are ones that if, if the change in the ozone standard was relatively drastic, then they also would fall into a non-attainment um, situation. What happens is if you have a state with non-attainment areas, you have to put together a plan, it's called the state implementation plan, and submit it to the federal government, and they will bless it uh, or they will deny it. And basically these are where the localized rules, uh, where the rubber hits the road, the rules come out of these state implementation plans and that's what we're kind of tracking. In addition to that, the federal government will set out new source performance standards for anything that puts out any kind of pollution whatsoever. So you have a new source performance standard for turbines and boilers and dry cleaners. Um, the ones that we're talking about today specifically is um, it's just a section of the Clean Air Act. Quad I is for diesels. Uh, quad J is for spark igniter or natural gas engines. Um, within quad I is where you get the, the nomenclature tier two and tier four. And that's that, that's what we, we talk about all the time. If you're familiar with this industry, a tier two engine versus a tier four, tier four being cleaner. Um, NECHAP is another federal regulation. I only bring it up in the sense that it was unique in that it went after existing sources. Most of the federal regulations have to do with new engines going in or new sources going in. NECHAP was a retroactive rule that went after sources that were out there but still running. So this is, uh, I touched on the SIP plan, the idea that, um, that the states have to put in their own plans and submit it to the federal government. Um, there's highway funds at stake. If, uh, if the federal government doesn't like your SIP, it'll kick it back to you. And if after you're massaging it several times and, and several back and forth, if they still don't like it, they can put in what they call a federal implementation plan or a FIP. Um, but a lot of the regs that we're seeing that I'm going to mention are driven by this non-attainment um, phenomena. Big picture, how is the country doing with pollution? So if you were to normalize all the different, the six different criteria pollutants and compare them to the standard. So the standard in this case on this graph is the dotted zero percent across the middle. Um, just about every pollutant uh, through the years or the last 20, 30 years uh, has come down substantially and are well below the threshold. So you don't see these non-attainment maps with a lot of counties colored in for the other pollutants. The only one where you really see a map like I've been showing is ozone, and that is the light green that you see as it bounced down over time, that when that standard, that the dotted line goes lower, you end up with um, more non-attainment areas. So this is just on a national basis. Um, obviously, different counties would have different graphs along these lines. Why is this important? So once you're failing, they're going to grade you by how bad you're failing. So if you're just slightly over the standard, you're said to be in marginal non-attainment. If you're well over the standard, if you're Los Angeles, California, you're said to be in extreme non-attainment. Um, how does this affect a facility who's flying, filing for a permit? Well, the most important part of this thing is this orange circle over on the right. This is the threshold for a major source. Once you are in a non-attainment area, if you go over, if your facility-wide emissions go over a certain cap, then you're dealing with the federal government and that's not something you wanna do. You want to avoid being called a major source. Um, the threshold to trip into that phenomenon is go, uh, obviously it goes lower as your conditions, ambient conditions get worse. So in Los Angeles, any facility that emits over 10 tons per year of a criteria pollutant is gonna end up dealing with the federal government with a major source permit. You hear the expression quite often, Title V. Title V is just a section of the Clean Air Act that has to do with major sources. So for the sake of this discussion, they are synonymous. Title V um, and a, a major source, I'm gonna use them interchangeably. Um, but it's important that Remember I said they're going to change that standard periodically every five years. If you end, if you were in a moderate non-attainment area and your conditions got worse, um, if the pollution ambient conditions got worse and you bumped into serious, then your threshold just got cut in half. And that's, that's a phenomenon we're seeing in a couple spots right now. And I want to, we're going to address that. Um, you see moderate 
way over on the right, 100 tons, and then Sirius, 50 tons. So it's always knowing that you don't want to be a major source. It's always a limbo game of, of figuring out what are you going to do to your operations to stay just below that line. So, for example, if you were to put in 10 2.5 megawatt engines, and again, we're going to be heavily focused on data centers. That's kind of a sweet spot. It's kind of grown north of that to 3 meg in a lot of applications, but call it a 2.5 megawatt engine. At 100 hours, you can put in 10 engines if your threshold is 50 tons, where it would have been 20 engines if your threshold was 100 tons. And that's so you have to keep restricting your hours or you put in less engines to stay below that threshold. If, if you were at 100 hours, and this is just kind of a, for an emergency engine discussion, if you're at 100 hours of allowable runtime outside of a blackout, um, and you were classified as a major source, but then you modified your operations to get, to put out less pollution, you would become what they call a synthetic minor source. Um, and, and we'll get into this in greater detail. So Denver, um, this is an example of an area that was one designation and then it got reclassified as severe. So there is this whole section, it's, it, a lot of times non-attainment areas are not just one county, they're a group of counties and that's what's happening here. So if you have a data center in um, Denver or just north of Denver, um, you are probably gonna be faced with this. If you had, set up your operations to limit your hours to stay below the major source threshold and then the major source threshold just got cut in half um, you're going to end up having to go back into your permit and, and make some changes again why do you want to avoid being a, a, a title five um, you're dealing with a, a permit that takes considerably longer um, it's uh, it's expensive it's very very elaborate um, Probably when you talk to data center owners, more than anything else, there are physical inspections of the facility by the federal EPA. You'll have an EPA enforcement person in your facility walking around. And, and they're, you know, they're, they're good people and they're doing their jobs, but uh, you, there's no upside to having a federal inspector walking through your facility, especially if they're not familiar with your operations and, and, and what you're doing there. Um, you also run into something called lowest emissions, a lowest available emissions rate or lowest achievable emissions rate and public notice. A lot of data centers like to go in, I wouldn't say under the cover of darkness because that sounds kind of shady, but they would they like to go in unnoticed if they could. So avoiding public notice, avoiding having to put being on TV or uh, back in the old days, they put notice in the new, newspaper or sign up at the post office. If you can avoid that, um, it's always a good thing. One thing that is changing on a federal level is, remember there's not national land barrier quality standards for all six pollutants. Um, they are changing the particulate matter standard. It's in the midst of that right now. Uh, it changes monthly. So I'm just letting you know that it's going to be lowered. So the map of non-attainment areas for particulate matters is barely colored at all right now. There's the San Joaquin Valley and a couple of other spots randomly. Um, places that are geographically challenged, mountains on both sides will end up with a soot problem. So particulate matter, again, is the visible emissions. Um, but if they lower the standard, there'll be a lot more counties that will come into that. So it's worth saying, I'm going to send this presentation out uh, when we're done. So when I go flying through these slides, uh, don't feel like you, you, uh, I'd be honored if you, if you felt the information was worthy of taking notes, but you don't have to because I'm going to be sending out the presentation anyway. Um, anyway, they also tied COVID. Uh, they, they married some of the COVID uh, phenomenon with the particulate matter. They were basically saying COVID is worse in places where there's high particulate matter. So that's going to drive the regulation. Obviously, all of this is, has to do with the government. So what is modeling? Modeling is taking an emissions concentration in, that comes from a facility and seeing how it affects your neighbors. Uh, it's probably the easiest way to put it is if you have a facility and you have neighbors that live at the boundary line of the facility or within a certain distance, there's always going to be rules to protect those folks, and rightfully so, um, from whatever you're doing within the, um, the boundary line of your facility. 
Um, one of the, the exercises, one of the pollutants that's quite often modeled is, is NO2. So it's just one of the components of NOx is um, nitrogen dioxide. There is a, a ambient level that you can have at the border, at the boundary line of your facility for NO2. It's part of a federal rule. Um, so the consultants on the line are going to be doing modeling for that all the time. Why do I bring this up? Well, the diesel engines that, that you have at your facility emit NOx. Um, a certain portion of that NOx will be NO2. So this is an exercise that a data center operator is likely going to be faced with, is figuring out, is that NOx coming from my diesels going to affect any of my neighbors? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into this. Certainly stack height is the higher you go with a stack, the better dispersion um, of that pollutant you'll get. Um, if you, if you have all of your engines at the center of the facility, that, that's better than having them in the boundary line when you're taking into account how does this affect your neighbors. So there's a lot of, um, like if you were to buy all their neighboring land, there's, that's one way of taking care of it. But also the hours of operation can come into play depending on what model you use, there's a lot to it. Um, exit velocity, do you have a narrow exhaust pipe or you, you is that, plume shooting higher up into the sky, that kind of thing. Um, and this has actually become an issue because data centers who are extending their stacks to uh, avoid any high NO2 concentration at the boundary line are actually drawing attention to themselves. This is a picture on the, uh, on the right. This is actually from a newscast. You see the channel nine there. Those are engines in the bottom right next to the nine with an exhaust pipe going out with a a very tall exhaust stack, it's shrouded um, to appear as if it's part of the building. But uh, this is a, it's expensive, and this is uh, an effort to not put on pollution controls um, to some extent, because if, if you get the pollution high enough, you can clear up the NO2 issue. Um, our hope is that by installing pollution controls, you can avoid stacks of this height. And, and that's generally been the case. If you're going to get 90% reduction of this pollutant, um, the necessity to install that stack, it, it should go away. I mean, this also becomes uh, an entrainment, what they call entrainment issue, in that those gray things at the top of the building, those are uh, have to do with the, um, the crack units um, or the air conditions for the computer room. You end up with a drafting or an entrainment issue where you're pulling exhaust from the diesel into the building. Um, if you could keep that exhaust stack at the ground level or pretty close to it, but reduce the pollution, that should solve a lot of that problem. Um, and this, is, this is what we're seeing more and more often with data centers is stacks in shrouds. Um, sometimes it's still required even after the pollution control, but um, the hopes are that when you put on the pollution control, it will lessen this requirement. So uh, this is the last federal rule that I'll touch on. So the new source performance standards for stationary diesel engines um, or our quad I, um, and it's just, again, it's a section on the Clean Air Act. And it has to do with how the engines are operating. If a tier two engine is, is your base engine that's created by any engine manufacturer, and I don't want to name them because I'll leave somebody out and we work with all of them. Um, but if you were if you were to buy an engine and it's uh, just your base unit, it's a, it, what they call a tier two engine. That is is perfectly suitable from a federal perspective to use as a backup emergency generator. They define a an emergency very clearly, and they give you a limit of 100 hours of non-emergency use. Um, but if you're just going to use it strictly as backup, a tier two should be fine from a federal perspective. Um, Folks want to do what they call exercising the diesel or testing it periodically. Again, it's vitally important for these diesels to run during an outage. So you're going to want to test them once a month, once every two weeks, turn it on, make sure it works, make sure the batteries are working, make sure the fuel is supplied, um, and then turn it off. You just They call it exercising. Well, just about all data centers will do it. And that's permitted um, within these 100 hours. Once you go to run more than 100 hours, or you try to use the diesel engine for some revenue generating activity, and a revenue generating activity would be 
classic peak shaving or enter into what they call a demand response program where you signed up with the utility and you're on call to get off of the grid um, in the case that the grid is strained um, and you're making money with that diesel engine. The federal government will ask you to use a tier four generator. Now that's the, the one that comes out. Uh, it's actually tier four final uh, since 2015. It's 90% cleaner. Uh, as across the board, uh, it includes particulate matter, it includes NOx, um, and that that is the uh, the recommendation and the the way the rule is written from a federal perspective. You would need to buy from the engine manufacturer a Tier Four certified diesel to run in, in non-emergency use. Um, they then took this rule and gave it to the states. It's called um, accepting delegation. Basically, they delegated to the states to enforce. Not all, not all of the states accepted the delegation, and some of the states are giving you some leeway in that rule. And what I mean by that is there's two ways of getting your engine that clean. One way is to buy the Tier 4 certified solution that the federal government told you to buy. The other solution would be to buy a Tier 2 and then add after, after treatment to it. Um, and get it clean or cleaner to meet your, your local regs. The perfect example of this is New Jersey. In New Jersey, um, the regulation is stricter than tier four. So really your only option to get there would be a tier two engine plus pollution control to get to that even cleaner solution. But if you were to ask the federal EPA, they would not be happy with that solution. Um, we could spend an hour on this, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, the reason why data centers don't like a certified solution is because the way the rule works and the way that certification process works, if anything goes wrong with that pollution control equipment, the engine has to derate and shut off. This is a, a, a carryover from the on highway regulations where the, the, the trucks were also getting cleaner engines. Um, the trucks were getting SCR systems, NOx controls on their engines, and they didn't want the truckers to neglect the upkeep of those pollution controls. So they, they basically said, all right, you're gonna get a number of warning lights, which is what's pictured here. You're gonna get a number of warning lights. And if you ignore them, your engine's gonna slowly bog down and derate, and then eventually it's gonna shut off. Unfortunately, when they carried that regulation over to the stationary world, that was still in there. So, um, as you can imagine, if you're a hospital and you bought a tier four generator, uh, that would be an issue that if you ran out of diesel exhaust fluid or if something went wrong with the pollution controls, the engine wouldn't run. They have carved out exceptions for direct and indirect risk to human life, but it's still a cumbersome process dealing with inducement. So when given the option, a data center will usually go the compliant route. That's the idea of a tier two plus after treatment. And because the only reason why that's kosher is because these are still emergency engines. If the if the data center operator is still using it as strictly emergency, they can they can get to uh, a a tier four level with this going this route. Anyway, I I beat that to death. I'm going to keep going. Um, HBO. This uh, outside of hydrogen, there is no other word you hear more often at data center conferences than the idea of using hydro treated vegetable oil in your diesel. Um, this is a 100% renewable fuel. Uh, if you can get it uh, and the price is right, God bless you. It's it's fantastic. Um, there are a number of places to get it in Europe. Uh, there's a, a few suppliers in the U.S. I can't say that I know whether the volumes are there, um, but you are seeing a lot of permits go in where they're they're setting up the permit to run on either fuel. And fuel switching is actually an issue. It became an issue 10 years ago when folks wanted to do something called bifueling. And bifueling is the idea that you take a, a kit, if you will, and you add it to your diesel engine and it blends in natural gas and then and you can get a lot more hours out of your diesel fuel tank if you're blending in natural gas into the air intake, you're basically using that natural gas as part of the combustion process. The issue is that you got certified on that engine for a specific fuel. Any engine, whether it's tier two certified or tier four certified, is tied to a specific fuel during that certification process, most likely that being ULSD. If you switch that fuel to bi-fuel, uh, 
um, EPA rule that your your certification went out the window and you had to do a bunch of emissions testing. We went to the EPA and said, okay, you set a precedent here with biofuel, how do you feel about HVO? And they were actually very good with HVO. They, they understood that it was a good thing for everyone involved and they referred to it as a drop-in fuel. And because most of the OEMs are okay with HVO as far as their the warranty on their equipment, um, it seems like at this stage that substituting HVO for ULSD is gonna go through without any real hitch. Um, the good news also is Ameritech has done a lot of work researching HVO and potential poisons in the fuel. Right now, we don't see any issues with running on HVO, provided that the exhaust flow and temperature and pollution concentrations from the engine are what they say they were on ULSD or lower. Um, we should be good, but we're gonna look at the fuel spec on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, um, we're rolling. So there is a, a lot of interactive maps of where data centers are in the US. Um, my, one of my favorites is it's called Bextel, B-A-X-T-E-L, where, where you can actually go to this map and, and go to the state and they'll show you where the data centers are, who's there. Um, it's pretty amazing to see how just about every state has some data centers there. Some of them are considered edge data centers, but um, they're everywhere. Now, when you're setting a data center, and there, there are teams of folks, because there's hundreds of millions of dollars at stake when you buy land and you're gonna build a data center, these people are a lot smarter than I am. But if you talk to them and you ask them, well, what were the criteria for for setting your data center where you, where you put it, that, the number one thing used to be, where is the fiber? This is why everybody is in Loudoun County, Virginia. So back in the AOL days, AOL days, there was fiber built on the town planners built fiber under there. There was a lot of government um, facilities around there. It was the perfect place to build data centers. Um, that is, is still certainly a criteria. You're gonna need latency and that, that's the speed at which and proximity at which the information flows. Um, but right now, the price of land in Ashburn, Virginia is $3 million an acre. So if you could put it somewhere else, it's probably a good idea. Um, tax incentives are huge. You see a lot of, of states uh, modifying their tax code to try to attract uh, data centers. Columbus, Ohio did this. A lot of folks are moving to Columbus, Ohio. Um, the other thing, the two big things that have changed probably in the last few years is Cost of power was always important because, I mean, these data centers use huge amounts of power. That's why there's all these data centers in Quincy, Washington. There's no other reason to be in Quincy, Washington. It's a, it's a pretty spot, but because it, the cost of power is two cents or south a KW, that's why all the data centers are there. Um, the prices of power are going up everywhere and as well as the availability. In the last six months, just about every data center project we have been involved with has run into some power availability issue. We're going to go into the one in, in Virginia in a second, but it's happening just about everywhere. We were dealing with a data center in Chicago that can't get power and build a substation. Um, no one really saw this coming. Uh, for the longest time, Dominion was just churning out these substations and it was great, um, but that seems to be slowing down. Um, the other thing, the picture on the right is uh, sub-Atlantic cable, um, this is the fiber. So when you have fiber going over to uh, uh, the UK, for example, um, you'd wanna put your data center close to where it lands, hit land, makes landfall in the US. Uh, the, the newest one that went in is essentially down at, by Norfolk, Jamestown. So you're seeing land being bought between Ashburn and Jamestown as people build data centers along that route. Um, the other last critical thing I, I, worth mentioning, and I got to pick up the pace, um, is renewables. You know, these data centers are all zero carbon footprint data centers. So they start with the power that they get from the utility and they look to see how much of that is already renewable. Um, if you're Quincy, Washington, and most of your power is hydro, that's fantastic. In, in Dominion, it's about 30% nuke, and you can count that as renewable. But outside of that, they don't have a lot of renewables. So they're gonna be looking at building data centers at places where the, the utilities uh, generation mix has more and more um, renewables on it. CBRE is another great source of, of, of data on the data center build side of things. 
Um, and when they talk about their markets, they talk about them as primary markets and secondary markets. They used to say tier one, tier two, too many things are called tiers. So primary market and secondary market. Here are four places I just wanted to visit briefly about that are primary markets um, for data centers. So the Bay Area, if you didn't know where Silicon Valley is, it's on the south, the San Francisco Bay, the very southern tip of the San Francisco Bay is San Jose, Santa Clara. That is where Silicon Valley is. Um, a whole can of worms opened up uh, in December of 2020 when the Bay Area Air Quality Management changed their BACT rule. Now, BACT is best available control technology. So a little background on California. There's 35 different air, air districts. There's one governing authority for the mobile sources that travel amongst or in between those districts, that's CARB. Um, when you put in, and this is just on the, the rated output of the generators that you're putting in, if you're gonna be putting in more than 50 megawatts on your site, you are introduced to the people of the California Energy Commission, that's the CEC, and then you get involved in the California's version of the Clean Air Act, which is CEQA. So that would be the Environmental Quality Act. There's a lot to this. <laughs> We can't spend too much more time on it. But what was happening back in you know, three years ago now, two and a half years ago, was the grid was starting to fail. You guys, everybody's probably heard about all of the rolling brownouts, the fires, everything that was happening uh, at PG&E out there. And people were buying generators like crazy. The data centers had always been buying backup generators, but you know, all these other folks, department stores, everybody was putting in backup diesel generators. What PG&E was doing was they would turn off the power proactively to avoid creating a wildfire. That was called a PSPS or a public safety power shutdown event. Um, what they saw was that there was all of these PSPS events, the utility was shutting down the grid to keep to avoid fires and the grid collapsing. And all of these diesel generators were coming up at the same time. Um, and when you do that, you're creating a lot of pollution. These are all tier two or worse uh, generators. So they did a study, um, the CPUC did a study and basically said, all right, in one month, there was 806 PSPS events. Um, and the average duration of an outage was 43 hours. There was 1,800 backup diesel generators. They put out about 126 tons of NOx. This can't fly. So they, they said, we're going to forget about cost effectiveness. We're just going to change the rule. Um, and they're gonna, they went to the data centers and said, all right, you have five options. Going forward, you can either put in a tier four generator if you need to. That, that was not their number one option. They wanted something else. But it, it, if you have to do something, you can either put in a tier, tier four generator or move it to a natural gas generator or do a fuel cell, preferably a hydrogen fuel cell. You can use a micro turbine or a, a renewables plus storage. When the data centers evaluated all these options, the, the lesser of the evils was tier four generators and they move forward with primarily putting in tier four compliant generators or tier four equivalent generators. That's the idea of tier two plus after treatment. So the final rule came out Christmas week of 2020, any engine over a thousand horsepower, regardless of its operation, all these are essentially backup generators needed to be tier four equivalent. Again, that's the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. You see San Jose at the southern tip. This is the, the population of data centers down at the southern part of the Bay is, is pretty intense. That's Santa Clara. Even if you zoom in on Santa Clara, that's just one area of Santa Clara. You can see it's probably 20 blocks wide. There was 36 or 56, three megs going in here. It was 54, 2.25 megs going in here, 32, three megs. These are just applications that were on the Bay Area's desk when the rule changed. So you can see why this was such a concern. The, the, the issue is that the rest of the country, all of these air boards talk to each other and quite often they, they benchmark what California is doing um, when they develop their own regulations. And you'll see that's what Arizona did, and we'll get into that. So before the change, an engine over a thousand horsepower most likely would just get a diesel particulate filter. That's the control technology to control the soot. And that came out of some air toxics regulations that they already had in place. Um, after the change, it was a diesel particulate, particulate filter 
plus Knox controls, so SERs came into the game. In Virginia, uh, same kind of thing, uh, probably even worse as far as volume of engines and concentration of data centers. 70% um, of the world's internet traffic goes through Loudoun County, Virginia. This is just right outside of Dulles Airport. Um, Virginia DEQ, this is also a Virginia DEQ non-attainment area, that part of the state. So they have their own regs and they have their own definition of an emergency. Um, so it can differ from the federal regulation in that a definition of emergency in Virginia DEQ is, is said to be an unforeseen event. Okay, that doesn't seem like it's a big deal. But what happens when Dominion, the utility, needs to do a substation upgrade? When they need to do a substation upgrade, they're gonna end up in a situation where they're gonna turn you off. They're gonna tell you six months in advance, we're gonna turn you off. Um, but uh, they, that does not count as an outage as far as Virginia is concerned. So you can't really, um, can't run your diesel generators and say, okay, there was an outage because it really wasn't. I'm just, I just looked at the time, I got to pick it up to pace. But anyway, um, so again, you want to avoid Title V uh, because it's a non-attainment area. That threshold is 100 tons. Um, there's a tremendous shortage of power right now. Dominion says it's probably going to be 2027 before you can get a new substation. Um, that changes daily. So uh, a lot of folks are still buying land. A lot of folks are still moving ahead with construction. Um, but there is an issue at hand. The other thing that's happening in the DEQ doesn't really trust necessarily your tier two generator. If you put in just a tier two generator, they likely will ask you to test at least one of them uh, to prove that your NOx meets their limit, which is six grams for brake horse power hour at full load. Um, if um, you're gonna do any other demand response or something like that, they're gonna look for 0.6. But uh, Cooking Green, uh, this, is, this is one of the first reports that came out that started with this. You'll see a lot of pushback on data centers right now. Um, this report came out in 2019. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but if you have some free time, it basically is calling out the data centers for not for being zero carbon footprint, but not creating, not but still connecting to the utility and using utility power. It is zero carbon footprint, but the way they're achieving that is by by funding renewables at other sites and and getting what they call renewable energy credits. Um, it's perfectly legitimate, and this country's um, percentage of renewables would be half of what it was if it wasn't for the data centers. Um, but they basically pointed out that Dominion's grid is not that clean. And of all these folks, what percentage of their renewables are in state versus out of state? It was, it was a black mark on the data center world and, and we're trying to help them push back against that. Dallas-Fort Worth, um, it, uh, this is one of those places where the designation changed. So if you were, um, if you were, if you modified your operations to stay below the major source limit, the major source limit got cut in half, and now you have choices. Do you either change your number of hours that you're allowed, or do you put on pollution controls? We're seeing a tremendous amount of NOx controls going into Texas, and a lot of it's driven by that rule. When I talk about how many engines and how many hours, there's a rule of thumb that's pretty safe. That's There's your nondescript hidden in a box gray engine. Um, if it's a tier two 2500 KW, let's say the not to exceed for NOx uh, is about 6.38 grams for brake horse power hour. If you want to permit that for 100 tons, that ends up being two and a half tons for NOx. So you've got a 2.5 megawatt generator putting out 2.5 tons of NOx. So quick back of the envelope calculation, if your threshold is 40 tons, if you're in Maricopa County and your threshold is 40 tons, that means you can put in 16 2.5 megawatts at 100 hours or 13 3.2 megawatts at 100 hours. What would likely happen is you'll put in way more than that and then you'll strict your hours south of 50. Um, and that's what that's about. Maricopa County, um, this is Phoenix, Mesa, uh, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about you've got the, the state jurisdiction and you've got local jurisdiction. Um, there's a lot of counties that decided to be, uh, because they're, they have the non-attainment areas, they decided to be stricter. Maricopa County benchmarked the Bay Area, 
So when the Bay Area changed about 90 days later, uh, Maricopa County announced their change. Now it's it's the same but different. They want tier four NOx uh, levels, but the threshold to get into best available control technology there is is really high for PM. So it's it's most likely you're just going to be looking at NOx controls if you trip over the threshold. The only thing worth noting about Maricopa County is that they have what they call a five-year look back. So <clears throat> there is a phenomenon that the airports call it sham permitting. The idea that a data center goes in and phases and you only tell them about each phase piece by piece. They hate that. They'd rather you say, all right, I got six phases, each one is 30 engines. And then from day one, you're permitting with the, the thought of a total build out. And so to get, because they got burned, the, Air, the Maricopa County felt they got burned on this, they decided to have a five year sliding window. So anything you put in counts as over five years counts as a single installation. Um, we've been back and forth with them about testing. This is always gonna be a negotiation as part of the permit process. Um, Virginia's very much on top of this, the idea you, text, you test for NOx at full load, the certification process is a five mode weighted average. That's the last thing you want to do in the field. So we're working with them to do that. Um, 10 seconds on uh, marketing. If you haven't seen an SCR system before, uh, I just got a couple slides in here. An SCR system is a catalytic converter that involves the injection of urea or DEF. There's going to control panel. It's going to meter in um, DEF, which is diesel exhaust fluid. Uh, it's 32.5% urea in water. It's going to spray it in in a very fine mist. It goes across the catalytic converter, um, and that's your NOx controls. And you can package it in a number of different ways. The, these controls will fit inside an enclosure or they'll fit inside the engine room. If they go on top of the enclosure, you can do it in pieces. You can do it as a single unit. This is a, a single unit where the diesel particulate filter blocks are in the front and then the SCR blocks are in the back. All right, back to our regularly scheduled program. That's what one looks like on top of an enclosure. Some secondary markets with the five minutes I have left. Um, Hillsboro, Oregon uh, is just west of Portland and they've had a large influx of data centers there. This rule clean, that came out of Clean Air Oregon is completely different than any other rule I've seen. Um, maybe the consultants on the line have seen something similar but they really looked at what they call hazardous air pollutants. Um, and they looked, it, it goes back to that modeling exercise that I talked about before. Here's the 20 something compounds that, that Clean Air Oregon is gonna look for out of your diesel engine. Now, a lot of these don't actually come out of the diesel engine, but you have to prove that they don't come out of the diesel engine. If you don't have the data, you're gonna have to use what they call their emissions factors and assume that they do. This is driving, um, diesel particulate filters as a retrofit technology in uh, Hillsborough in Oregon. Um, uh, Salt Lake City, an, another big data center market that's growing out there. This, their rules, this, here's where some of the rules. The Air Board, um, the Department of Environmental Quality was exposed to SCR systems way back when, when the NSA data center went in 10 or yeah, 10 years ago. Um, so they know about um, NOx controls. Um, some of the data centers do not have NOx controls. Uh, some do. Uh, it really has everything to do with whether or not you're going to take a relatively severe hour restriction. If you really restrict your hours, which hurts your flexibility to, for testing and maintenance, um, you can avoid controls for the most part. Here's the non-attainment areas in Salt Lake City. Um, Reno, and again, people are building data centers in places that, are, that seem obscure, but they have reasons for it. Uh, Reno is, is not far from the Bay Area, and it, um, the regulatory climate, everything about it is just outside California. So uh, what's funny about Reno is you've got two counties up there, this Washoe County, if you're right over that boundary line. It, here's the data centers in Reno. If you were to draw a diagonal line across the corners, the bottom three are in a different county. They didn't need controls. The ones in the top didn't need controls. Um, they're also big on SCR warm-up. When you put on an SCR system, you don't get NOx controls immediately. Uh, when you turn on your engine, it's going to be a certain amount of time before they kick in. So that's that. 
Iowa has a, an issue. Um, there's a lot of data centers around uh, Des Moines and Council Bluffs, which is just east of Omaha. Um, what's tricky about Iowa is that their background particulate matter. So if you were to do modeling, um, your background particulate matter comes into the equation. That it's relatively high in Iowa. So the first inquiries we got were for diesel particulate filters only, but then they went into SDRs and diesel particulate filters. Uh, Quincy, Washington, I've mentioned it a bunch of times. The thing about the Department of Ecology in, in Washington State is they are all about um, showing what's out there. Uh, it's probably politically correct. They, they love putting things on the website about what data centers are out there, where they are. Here's an aerial view of the data center. So if you're trying to go in and install something relatively quietly, it's not going to happen in Washington. Um, but that's a modeling. All the controls that are there have to do with a certain number of engines and modeling. Um, they also have a ton of public comment. Uh, I've been to a couple of those public comments sessions in Quincy. They can get relatively heated. Um, and testing was a big deal there. Uh, talked about testing. Um, let me just touch on this one last thing. So in Virginia, oh, I showed you the power mix in Virginia, um, and that uh, you can see from Dominion's um, power mix that they their resources include a lot of gas, some coal, some nuke. Um, they burn biomass, which is actually pretty nasty. Um, so we did this study where if you were a data center operating in Ashburn and you ran 30 megawatts of very clean diesels, we call them tier five, but we, you push the technology to the, the cleanest you can get a diesel. If you ran that for an hour, how much pollution uh, came out of that, those diesels compared to how much pollution was generated by the utility to give you the 30 megawatts for an hour? Um, you take in, we took into account um, eight to 10 pollutants, some of them greenhouse gases, but mostly pollutants. We then um, attached the EPA's social cost to them. You often hear about social cost of carbon. There's social cost with every pollutant, like for example, mercury has a very, very high social cost because even in small concentrations is very, very harmful. Um, and then we compare, it's, it's similar to PUE, we compare the how much environmental effect did the diesels put out versus the, the utility for that same amount of power for an hour. And that ratio, showed that we could get the diesels 20% cleaner than the utility. Now that GVU or less than one, you can't achieve that everywhere in Quincy, we would lose. Um, and if there's a, a large nuke, like if we did this in France, we would probably lose because of uh, all their nuclear power. But it's, it's just an interesting uh, eye-opening way to look at your diesels um, and helps the data centers push back a little bit as to whether or not um, diesels uh, are always bad and that you should always be putting in hydrogen fuel cells. We think that by stretching the technology, we can give a longer runway. Uh, we're not kidding ourselves by 2030 um, or 2035. It's, it's unlikely that you're going to have diesels at data centers anymore, but um, in the, in the midterm, in the short term, we can, we can help them defend their use um, for the most part. But I think that was it. Uh, again, rapid fire, um, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jim. That was, that was great. Um, it looks like we have a little bit of time where we could do maybe a question or two. Um, looks like I have one. Is the horsepower rating of the engines what drives the attainment requirements? I'm, I'm sorry, can you just read it one more time? Is the horsepower rating of the engines what drives the attainment requirements? So the attainment, non-attainment um, has to do with the ambient air quality. So you've got those snippers on the poles measuring the emissions. That's how you're, you're they measure it over a multiple year average. Um, it's a very complicated process, but basically it's like a three year average. And if you have, even weather affects this. If you have a couple of hot summers, you might end up in an issue where you wouldn't otherwise. Um, so it really has, your your area gets graded first, um, and then your source has to deal with whatever your your facility 
is where it's sitting. So if you're in non-attainment and you're putting in an engine, they're going to look at your full load emissions. They call it not to exceed. You're going to look at your full load emissions and your allowable hours and calculate your potential to emit from that. So um, it's kind of apples and oranges. Your, your designation has to do with just how your, your current conditions, your application is going to, is whether you, you go over the major source threshold um, is going to count on your potential to emit. I don't know if that, if that makes it any clearer, uh, I, send me an email, I'll try to do better. Yeah, it looks like if there's any other questions, we still have a little bit of time. The only other one, the other one that I see just says, oh, awesome presentation. So appreciate that comment. Not really a question, but appreciate that. Um, looks like, yeah, that's all we have. So thank you for everyone for attending. A reminder, we will make a recorded version of this available later, and I'll be sending that out via email. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reply to that email and uh, we'll get it answered for you. So have a great rest of your day. We'll uh, see you all at the next one. Thank you.